You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Thrive knows that quitting smoking is hard. You get advice like try hypnosis or quit cold turkey. Instead, start small with Thrive, which can lead to something big. Start stopping with Thrive. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 66, The Third Republic, Part 6, Political Cleanup. This week, a big thank you goes out to Clayton, Joe, Sam, Matthew, and Hunter for choosing to support this podcast on Patreon, where they get access to ad-free versions of all of the podcast episodes, plus special patron-only episodes released roughly every month. If you'd like to find out more, head on over to historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. For those who did not support the Popular Front, the events of June 1936, when the Popular Front took power, were frightening. The strikes, the workplace seizures, and the general feeling of revolution were troubling, especially if they were to continue. Of course, they did not continue, as we discussed last episode. With the fall of the first Popular Front government, another, which would pursue a roughly similar program, was put in its place under the leadership of Camille Chatham as Prime Minister. The new government was made up almost entirely of radicals, either of the independent or socialist variety, and was primarily an early 30s-style centrist government. There would be continued reforms in many areas of French society. Some of the most important would be the creation of a nationalized rail system and greater rights for women, which gave them their financial and legal independence. Before these changes, women in France could not even open their own bank accounts. These changes were important and much was done to continue the changes made by the Bloom government, but any threat of large-scale changes based on socialist or communist principles was no longer a real possibility. Then, in 1938, the return of Dalladé heralded another center-right government which took France into the war years. A complicating factor in any major changes after 1937 was the looming threat of conflict in Europe. These years were the years of rearmament, when many of the nations of Europe believed that a war was in the future. They did not know when it would start or why, but they did believe that the risk of a conflict was drastically increasing every single year. Every nation began to look to its own defense in its own way, and started to prepare as best as it could. This brought with it economic and political strain, especially in the Western democracies, where it was challenging to balance the competing demands of military rearmament social change, and pacifist movements. In France, this would lead to another major round of strikes in 1938, and the workers of France tried to ensure that the reforms that had been made over the previous two years were preserved and made permanent, even under the pressure from the government to start rolling them back. Part of this friction was caused by rearmament, which is a topic that we will be discussing a bit today. We're going to look strictly at some of the driving forces within French politics and foreign policy and also discuss some of the financial discussions that were occurring around rearmament. The next episode, we will talk in more detail about the military side of that rearmament. It's important to have some discussion of the financial side of rearmament, because one of the major discussions and decisions that would occur in London and Paris during the late 1930s was not just how to build up their militaries as quickly as possible, but how to do so without ruining the nation's finances, finances that were felt to be essential for the coming war. One fact that deserves repeating, even if I've said it several times, is that the people making decisions in France during this period did not have perfect information about what other nations were doing. Intelligence gathering was a process, and one that could lead to incorrect information being seen as correct. Within France, there were two primary sources of information about other nations, which in our context is primarily Germany, let's just be honest. The two groups gathering the intelligence were the second sections, or the intelligence sections of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, and then another section, apart from those, which gathered signals intelligence and performed espionage. 
They, of course, both spent most of their time trying to determine what Germany's military capabilities were and when it was likely that Germany would use those military capabilities in a war. On the win question, they actually did pretty well, at least in late 1938. At that point, they pinpointed the period between 1940 and 1942 as the point of greatest danger. If you then look at German military thinking during this same period in 1938, that estimate kind of lines up. Even secret internal planning between Hitler and German military leaders was based around a war starting several years after 1939. While they did a good job of determining the win, the strength of the German military was greatly overestimated. Just to give two examples of this overestimation in practice. The French estimates for the number of German divisions that could be mobilized in case of war was 116. It was in reality 72. They also believed that the Luftwaffe had 2,760 operational aircraft, and over three quarters of that number were recent modern models. In actuality, the Luftwaffe had just 1,669 operational aircraft, and only about half of those were fully modern and capable. This overestimation would be of critical importance in the last years of peace, because it caused the French government and military, which might already lean towards caution, to lean even harder in that direction. This level of caution would be the driver of many of the decisions made in the two years before the war started in 1939. There were several examples of this caution in the years before the Munich crisis. Before that moment, there were multiple opportunities that the French could have used to start a war if they wanted to. The German introduction of conscription, the remilitarization of the Rhineland, or the Anschluss were all situations where, by technical treaty clauses, the French could have been able to claim that they had the right to attack Germany. But in none of those cases did that occur. The reasons for this were varied in detail, but broadly the same. It was difficult to get British and Italian backing for action, and the French military strongly recommended against going it alone. When Czechoslovakia turned into the next major crisis point, the factors had not greatly shifted. Much like the Anschluss, it was a small area of Eastern Europe which the French and British had a few direct interests in defending. As it appeared the tensions were rising in early 1938, the government under Chatham and then Dalide, who formed a new government in April, were divided as to what their response should be. There were some ministers who favored a hard line with Germany over the Sudetenland question, and there were others who believed that it was more important to work with the British, who were talking and taking a more cautious and conciliatory route. There were some within that cautious group who would have been swayed by the German military strength estimates being received from French intelligence services, and that massive overestimation was important. Even with these voices among French leaders, during the spring and summer of 1938, it would be the French who were trying to push British leaders to support a more firm approach to German agitation. The French military was ill-prepared for independent and decisive action, a shortcoming that mirrored the problems of 1936 when Germany had remilitarized the Rhineland. There were still many shortcomings in 1938, even though rearmament had started, and there was some concern within the Dalladay government that any European war would simply open up Western Europe to be taken over by communists, but this was met by growing resolve from some French politicians. The two strongest voices in the French government at this time would be Dalladay and Georges Bonnet, who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Bonnet would always be the voice of caution, while Dalladay would grow in his general push for a stronger stance against Germany over the summer months of 1938. These differing viewpoints would reach their climax on September 27th, when Dalladay even suggested a general mobilization during a cabinet meeting. The possibility of a strong French reaction was removed during the negotiations with Germany that followed in the coming months, which will be discussed in great detail in the next series of episodes. But for the French, there was a silver lining in this political defeat. For one, relations with Britain were once again strengthened. Now, of course, the, the major downside was that the Germans had once again been able to be the driver of events. Dalladay would claim that he had done all he could for the Czechs, but that the British simply refused to stand up to the Germans. In the aftermath of Munich, there was a new urgency in French preparations for war, and while this would of course involve rearmament, it also involved a renewed focus on the creation and cultivation of alliances with other nations. But even in this area, there were differing opinions. Those pushing for a greater emphasis on those alliances were taking something of a positive view, that with stronger alliances Germany could be in some way restrained. 
This was not the only viewpoint, though, and there were some that had already written off Eastern Europe as a lost cause, unworthy of further French investment. Such a pessimistic view of the overall situation would never enjoy a majority of support, because if Germany really did all control all of Eastern Europe, it made the overall defense of France basically impossible, since it would give Germany access to so many additional resources. The end result in this thinking would be the report prepared by the French general staff which outlined the huge quantities of raw materials that Germany could acquire in Eastern Europe. However, it also pointed out that if all these nations in Eastern Europe could be arranged together and were all sort of pointing against Germany, they had huge populations when combined that, that would help the number game against Germany, which was so much of a problem for France. One of the greatest what-ifs from these years before the war revolves around the complete failure of the negotiations between France, Britain, and the Soviet Union. The three nations would be involved in on-again, off-again talks for much of the 1930s, and they would culminate in many discussions after the Munich crisis. From the French perspective, the events in Russia, particularly the massive purges of the military, had greatly decreased the military power of the Soviet Union, making them far less desirable as an ally. The growth in Russo-German relations during this period was also well known, and this raised concerns that any French military information shared with the Soviet Union would find its way to Berlin, making them hesitant to engage in detailed staff talks. Also, and this is a topic that will become critical in the last months before the war, there was always the question of whether or not the Soviet Red Army would ever be able to meaningfully intervene in a European war. The problem was that the nations of Eastern Europe did not want the Red Army wandering through their territory, as they were just as concerned about Soviet aggression as they were about German aggression, and in a lot of ways it's kind of hard to blame them after the events of the early 1920s. These problems would eventually result in the molotov ribbentrop Pact, which is of course a story for another day. Interestingly, at this same time, there were concerns in London about what the French were planning, particularly their views on the defense of the European lowland countries. The lowland countries had always been an important part of British defense policy. In the past, it was due to naval bases that could be used by an enemy looking to invade England, and then in more recent years, the concerns about air power being projected over the English Channel amplified these concerns. The French were certainly less concerned about this area, especially when it came to putting any effort into defending the coastal areas, which were not of great French concern. Concerns about the fate of these areas would be one of the drivers for the escalating British assurances to nations on the continent that the British Empire would be there to help them in their defense. This meant greater guarantees both to France and to other nations, as well as greater cooperations and more in-depth discussions. Eventually, the British would propose an official alliance and immediate military staff talks in early February 1939. This would set the stage for a joint strategy, which would take shape over the summer of 1939. There would be a lot of traffic between the two capitals during these months, and there were both large and detailed decisions being made. These talks represented a large shift from both sides of the channel when compared to just a few years before. For the British, it represented a massive shift and, and committed the British to the continent in ways that had not been seen since the First World War. Meanwhile, for the French, it represented the final break from any attempts at accommodation and alliance with Italy, with the new plans in the wake of the Italian drift towards Germany focusing on trying to keep Italy neutral. Nowhere was the shift more important than in the naval sphere. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then, do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories— 
let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. Previously, we discussed some of these staff talks that occurred between France and Italy in the mid-1930s, particularly in 1935, before the Abyssinian event. During that time, there were many plans made between the two nations aimed at a war with Germany, down to the fuel requirements of Italian bombers flying to targets in Germany from French airfields. However, the French naval staff was never a huge fan of an alliance with Italy, and in fact, they simply refused to have similar conversations with the Italian navy. Admiral Francois Darlan would become chief of the naval staff in January 1937 and would continue this policy. Franco-Italian antagonism in the naval sphere had a long history, and during the interwar years, even as the nations were quite close together politically, the two navies still saw each other as their greatest threats. This drove much of the French and Italian interactions with the naval treaties in Washington and London. In both cases, their primary concern was not necessarily how their navies matched up to the big three of of Britain, Japan, and the United States, but mostly around how they matched up with each other. A similar comparison would drive rearmament efforts in the late 1930s. The greatest concern for Delon and the French Navy was the work that the Italians were doing on two new battleships, the Littorio and the Vittorio Veneto, which would be laid down back in 1934 and were scheduled to be completed by 1940. There were also plans to begin two new battleships which would be laid down in 1938. These would join several modernized battleships which were First World War vintage but but greatly enhanced, as well as a host of smaller vessels. The Italian construction was the justification that Darlan gave for a large French naval expansion plan, which would have included two additional battleships, which would have been the never-completed final two ships of the Richelieu class along with the maximum possible acceleration of the first two ships of that class, the Richelieu and the Jean Bart. This was all done to at least match the Italians, which Darlan thought would be the first enemy that France would face in a conflict. He would say in November 1937 that, quote, If we consider, at the same time, that the liberty of the sea is for Italy a question of life or death, and even more so for us, it seems that any offensive action by our armies that had not been preceded by the conquest of the Mediterranean will be a useless action. End quote. While this type of hyper anti Italian viewpoint would not be common until after the Anschluss and Munich crisis, everyone was certainly in agreement that the Mediterranean was crucial to any French war efforts. Because of this importance and the general drift of Italy away from good relations with France, Naval discussions with the British would put great focus on the Mediterranean. French naval planning would also shift in a very aggressive way near the end of 1938. However, no matter what argument was used and how important Delon and the other naval leaders claimed the naval war against Italy to be, it was almost impossible to convince other French leaders to shift resources away from the German front. Any aggressive action against Italy needed the French Air Force to cooperate but it had its own missions in Germany or against Germany, which it considered to be far more important. Some progress was made in convincing General Gamelin to perhaps a more aggressive stance against Italy, and that maybe it could bring a quick early victory that would secure North Africa and the vital supplies that the French war effort planned to draw from that area. Or as Gamelin would write in the summer of 1939, quote, In a Franco-British conflict against Germany and Italy, it is against Italy that the first Franco-British offensive efforts must be made. We will cover ourselves on the German side if possible, take the offensive action against Italy simultaneously in the Alps, Libya, and Italian Eastern Africa. This mindset would result in discussions with London in March 1939 that resulted in a plan for an Allied offensive in Northern Africa to be launched at the beginning of the war. This would have to include a strong set of operations against Italian naval assets and their supply routes across the Mediterranean. The level of aggressiveness that the French planned in the Mediterranean would even sway British thinking, as they'd been planning on making North Africa a secondary concern at the start of the war, 
Oddly enough, it would be the actions of the Italians that would prevent all of this from happening. They would make what would be, in reality, a pretty smart decision to set out the war for a bit, until after any ability of the French to commit to a proactive strategy in the Mediterranean had been lost because the Germans were marching near Paris. While all of the military and foreign relation discussions were occurring, there was also another constant topic of conversation among French leaders, and that was about financial planning. This comes back to the fact that the working assumption among French leaders was that the next war would be a long one, and so to facilitate fighting a long war, France had to be able to finance a lengthy war effort. There were many different pieces to consider in this regard, and some examples are the amount of capital that was available within the French economy to be either taxed by the government or invested in military industries, the amount of foreign currency available for the expected massive increase in imported goods, and the money necessary to finance mobilization, which would be needed at a moment's notice. These were all complicated by the fact that the best policies on day one of a war were not always the best policies that could be politically supported during peacetime. The first decisions that had to be made were around mobilization, and in these decisions they had to involve the leaders of the Bank of France. There were tensions between the two groups primarily around how a mobilization should be financed and what financial actions should be expected from the government when it occurred. The finance ministry wanted the bank to provide a large line of credit that could be used at any moment for the massive burst of spending that would be required when a war started. The bank wanted to push back against the government, insisting that while it could provide some money, it expected the government to also guarantee to make decisions about how it would then finance the war effort moving forward. They primarily wanted assurances that the government would enact changes to taxation and the taking out of loans to then finance spending instead of depending on more money from the Bank of France. These options were politically unpopular, and so there would be some resistance to any kind of preemptive taxation. The disagreements would prevent a more all-encompassing plan for war finance that probably should have been created during the rearmament period. Some agreements were reached before the Munich crisis. For example, in July 1936, the bank agreed to make a 2 billion franc uh, line of credit available for immediate mobilization spending, if it was required. It would not be until after Munich that major changes were made, and the bank, after both the Prime Minister and the President came into the conversations, increased that line of credit up to $25 billion. The cost of mobilization is an important item to consider, especially as it related to all of the various points in time during the 1930s when France could have done so due to various moves by Germany. Taking a few million men, bringing them into the armed forces, and sending them to their wartime positions was real expensive, which made the government hesitant to take the step unless it was absolutely sure that a war was going to occur. After Munich, there were also many discussions about what France planned to do after a war started, and one of those conversation topics was around exchange controls. The goal of these controls was to ensure that when the war started, the available foreign currency and gold reserve that were available in France were used in an efficient way. The focus on the available gold reserves was a statistic that would be very important when it came to how the leaders of French finance viewed preparations for war. The theory was that the more gold that the nation had access to, the more prepared it was for war because that gold could be used for foreign imports. By this metric of preparation, there was some real progress made with France's gold holdings rising in the years and months before the war, and it would reach a new peak in August 1939. This, along with a few other government policies around taxation and inflation, would have other benefits as well, and during the year before the start of the war, capital that had left France during the years of deflation came back to France at an impressive rate. However, the undue focus on just that number was problematic because it would cause a real hesitancy to spend money on improvements and in work that needed to be done before the war started. A brief discussion of the financial matters during the first months of the war is probably warranted here, just so we can kind of see where this story goes, uh, particularly as it relates to those gold reserves. When the war started, the first changes that were made were to take advantage of domestic sources of money that could be gathered quickly and then spent. This involved the sale of war bonds, which amounted to about 65 billion francs worth of income. Then there were also changes to the tax policies in France, with many different new taxes being introduced. For example, there was a tax introduced on overtime pay, with those hours being taxed at a rate of 
which was pretty impactful in armament industries that were working a lot of overtime. Another was an excess profits tax that was levied against corporations, which was again very impactful in armament industries. While these internal changes were being made, externally agreements were made with the British that allowed for both nations to purchase from the other without having to pay for those purchases in hard currency. This allowed goods to flow far more freely between the two empires without taxing either nation's gold reserves. And this really alleviated some problems with the massive increase in that foreign purchasing that would begin almost immediately after the war was declared. These moves were all net positives, but there were some problems that that were not taken care of. Imports that were coming into France were not well controlled, and in fact it was kind of chaotic, with a whole bunch of different businesses and governmental groups purchasing goods without much coordination. This went against the wishes of the finance ministry, as they wanted all foreign purchases to be centrally controlled to ensure that available currency and gold reserves were used optimally. While this would have been a good move in terms of protecting those financial reserves, there were many within the government, including the Prime Minister, Dalladé, who believed that by allowing a free flow of imports, war production would be increased at a much faster rate, and they considered this to be more important than holding on to a little bit of extra gold. While this may have been true, it was also disastrous for French gold reserves that had been so carefully husbanded in the years before the war. This would cause the Bank of France to notify the government that those reserves would be depleted by the end of 1940. Now, of course, by that point, there would be events that would happen that you may have heard of during 1940 that would make this not the biggest problem for France (laughs) by the end of 1940, Uh, but it would have been if they, you know, would have done a little better on the battlefield. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we discuss more about French rearmament in the years before the Second World War.